Good morning. Good morning. So today I'm going to be talking about the place of sacrifices or offerings for the Christian. And uh, I don't know why I have for sins there, but uh, anyway. Uh, the, the next heading is, uh, there th there, oh yeah, the first one was a sacrifice for sins. The second is the sacrifice of self, a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of doing good, and a sacrifice of giving. Now, I was kind of thinking I would uh, do a song every time I did one of these, but uh, I think that might mess up our Sunday school program, so we'll go ahead with... Uh, We'll do some worship now, but those are some of the songs we'll be looking at. The first song we'll look at this morning is uh, Once for All, and that is the sacrifice for sins. Jesus Christ has made the only sacrifice for sins that will ever be accepted. You don't have to offer some sacrifice for sin. You couldn't. No sacrifice you could make would be sufficient. And sadly, many religious people are constantly trying to make sacrifice for sins, hoping that it'll atone somehow for what they've done wrong. If I do good, then God will take, uh, will negate the bad, or all those kinds of situations. None of those are a reality, and none of those will happen. Only Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made on the cross and that is where we find freedom, and that is where we find salvation. So let's stand and sing. Free from the law, oh, happy condition, Jesus has bled, and there is remission, first by the law, and bruised by the fall Christ has redeemed us once for all once for all oh, sinner receive it once for all oh friend now believe it cling to the cross the burden will fall Christ has redeemed us once for all. There on the cross, your burden of bearing, thorns on his brow, your Savior is wearing. Never again your sin need appall. You have been pardoned once for all, once for all, oh sinner receive it, once for all, oh friend now believe it, cling to the cross, the burden will fall, Christ has redeemed us once for all. Now we are free, there's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, oh hear his sweet call. Come and he saves us once for all. Once for all, oh sinner receive it. Once for all, oh brother believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ has redeemed us once for all. Children of God. Glorious calling, surely His grace will keep us from falling, passing from death to life at His call. Blessed salvation, once for all, once for all, oh sinner receive. Do 
the cross, the burden will fall. Christ has redeemed us once for all. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ has redeemed us once for all. G, sorry. Yeah. You know, this uh, sacrifice that Christ made on the cross uh, comes back to us so that we give an offering. And sacrifice and offering have the same meaning. We give an offering of praise to God. And the scripture says we're continually praising him. It says it's the fruit of our lips to give the praise to God. So let's keep on praising Jesus. What am I gonna do when the hard times come? What am I gonna do? I can't see the sun. What am I gonna do when my hope is dim? I'll keep on praising you. Praise you in the morning. Praise you in the evening. Praise you when the sun goes down. I'll be giving you the glory Even when I'm grieved as I was lost But now I'm found I'm giving you glory Telling your story Yes, I'll keep on praising you What am I gonna do when the good times roll? What am I gonna do when my heart is gold? What am I gonna do on the mountain top? I keep on praising you. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when the sun goes down. I'll be giving you the glory, even when I'm grieved as I was lost, but now I'm found. Giving you glory, telling your story, yes, I'll keep on praising you. It doesn't matter much what this world might bring. My hope is in heaven at Jesus' feet since he died on the cross and rose again. I'll keep on praising you. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when the sun goes down. I'll be giving you the glory, even when I'm praying, as I was lost, but now I'm found. I'm giving you glory, telling your story, yes, so keep on praising you. Praise, praise you, Lord. Jesus, I'll keep on praising you. I said, praise, praise you, Lord. Praise, praise you, Lord. Praise, praise you, Lord. Praise, praise you, Lord. Praise, praise, you, Lord. praise the name of Jesus, I'll keep on praising you. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when the sun goes down. I'll be giving you the glory, even when I'm grieving I was lost, but now I'm found. I'm giving you glory, telling your story, yes I'll keep on praising you. Yes I'll keep on praising you. Yes I'll keep on Praising you. Amen.
Amen. Yes, clap to the Lord because we want to thank him because he's an awesome God. Amen. Amen. I come before you today. And there's just one thing that I want to say. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've given to me, for all the blessings that I cannot see. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, with a grateful heart. With a song of praise, with an outstretched tongue, I will bless your name, singing, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. and gave me your life. Yes, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name, singing thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. Yes, the Bible calls us to a sacrifice of praise, an offering of praise to the Lord. But it goes even further than that. It says uh, to present your whole being as a living sacrifice, that we surrender to Christ. We say, Lord, it's not my life anymore. It's yours. And if you think you can live your life and you're going to live the Christ life, you're sadly mistaken. It's all or nothing with Jesus. You can't just take Jesus along. I'll take him along for a ticket when I get on the other side and say, yeah, let me into heaven. No, you have to take Christ, and you have to take all of him. And let me tell you, there's nothing like him. There's no one like Jesus. You're not complete without Jesus. There's a hole in your life that nothing else can fill, a gap that you can try and fill with everything else, you're not complete without Jesus. You need him. Not just some truths about him, not just church, not just uh, coming and singing, but you need Jesus himself. So God gave us the best he could give because he offers us Christ himself. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more heaven now to give. 
He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is holy. sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark i am not forsaken for by my side the savior he will stay i labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this i hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead all the night has been won and i shall I dread, I know I am more dead than me. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath I long. said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus does the Lord do? He wants to put you to death. And what do you want to do? Not die. You want to keep on living your own life your own way. But most of us here have discovered it doesn't work out so well, living our life our own way. We've discovered when we have Christ, when he comes, he does a better job. And he doesn't take away the real you. Some people are so afraid of that. 
Well, if I surrender everything to Jesus and let him do the living in me, uh, I'm gone. Uh, the real person's gone. But it's the exact opposite. The real you is able to live. Because the real you is being confined because of sin. It's being destroyed because of sin. And it's being limited in a thousand ways because of sin. And Jesus wants to take you to the cross. To the place where you let him take over. And the real you begins to live in all of its wonder. Oh Jesus, take me to the cross. I can't live anymore. You said one would follow you to deny himself and take up the cross and follow follow you follow you and follow Give you all my heart. Full surrender is where I have to be. Everything, Lord, laid at your feet. All or nothing. Cold, for it's no longer I that's living here, but you, Christ, living in me, in me, but you, Christ, living moment is all that I have to you let you have your way for without you there's nothing I can do so take my life my heart cross to know your risen life I give you all my heart oh Jesus take me to the cross I can't live anymore show coming. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here. Yeah, it's Mother's Day. Well, everybody is blessed to have a mama, a mother. And if you don't have a mother, well, God will look after you. He can be a father and a mother to you. Oh, I see Lammy coming. Hello there, Millie. Hi, Lammy. Yeah, well, you know, it's supposed to be a special day today. Yes, it is. Yeah, I can't figure it out, 
because I heard somebody say Happy Brother's Day. Brother's Day? Yeah, I don't even have a brother, so I don't know if I can say Happy Brother's Day. But anyway, Happy Brother's Day to every brother that's here. Uh, Lammy, I think you're confused. Well, I don't know what I'm confused about. I heard more than one person say, Happy Brother's Day. No, they didn't say that. They said, Happy Mother's Day. Oh, so it's not Brother's Day? Nope. Oh, well, that's pretty good. I don't have a brother, but I do have a mother. <laughs> well, I guess you can say Happy Mother's Day to her. Well, I didn't this morning because I thought it was Brother's Day instead of Mother's Day, but later on in the today I'm going to say Happy Mother's Day instead of Brother's Day. Boy, you can sure uh, talk in riddles. Yeah, but uh, it makes sense to me. So great, I'll be able to tell my mother Happy Mother's Day. How many people here had a mother or has a mother? Raise your hand. Yeah, look, everybody's had a mother. Yeah, that's true. They wouldn't be here if they didn't have a mother. Yeah, well, um, yeah, mothers are special, aren't they? They're very, very special. Yeah, I know, because um, my mother's very special, too. My mother knows how to call me. When I was a little calf skipping in the field, when my mother said, Moo, I knew exactly it was my mother. Yeah, that's the same with my mother. There could be there could be a hundred sheep mamas in the field, and they all say, bah, bah. <laughs> and every lamb knows the sound of their own mother. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's true. Yep, when my mother went, bah, bah, I came running right to her, even though there was a hundred others going, bah, 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 bah. it was crazy. But everybody knew their own mothers. Huh. You know, that's like it says in the Bible. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice and they follow me. Oh, so Jesus is like a mother? He's like a mother and a father and a brother. He's like awesome in every way. And he can look after us all the time. Kind of like mothers do. Yes, they do. That's for sure. You know, there's no love like a mother's love. Hey, that's true. My mama really loves me. When I was a tiny little lamb, she used to hold me and she would sing, My sweet little lamb, my sweet little lamb. Oh, that was very cute, wasn't it? Yeah, I remember my sweet little lamb. Oh, that's pretty nice. Well, mine would go like this. Moo, 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 milly, milly, moo. Ah, boy, isn't it wonderful to have mothers? It really is. And I know some people, their mothers are not here anymore, but they still love them. That's true. And they can remember them. And when we all trust in Jesus, then we'll all be back together again. That's true, too. Well, it's wonderful to celebrate Mother's Day. I mean, I would celebrate Brother's Day if I had a brother, but I don't have a brother, but I have a mother, so I'm going to celebrate Mother's Day. S sounds good. Well, I got to go get some um, milk. Whoa, okay. That sounds good. And maybe I can say Happy Mother's Day to your mother. Yep, I think she's in the barn, so that will be exciting. Yeah, for sure. Well, happy Mother's Day to everyone here, and I hope that uh, you have a wonderful day, and you're very, 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 very special. It's true, very special. Mothers are very, very special. God made you that way, to love so much, and because God loves us so much that he puts that love in your heart. That's awesome. Well, time for milk. See you later. Bye. Bye. Let me want to take that. Yeah, so happy Mother's Day to all you moms here. I didn't forget. I just was saving it for the show. But 
it's uh, wonderful. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are people who maybe never got married or anything, but they are still and may not have children. But in a congregation, in a church, we're all family. And so often they are like mothers to other people's children, too, and helping them and coming alongside of them and caring for them. And uh, It's wonderful to be in the family of God. And uh, I so appreciate uh, uh, my mother. And she lived a long time. She was 96 when she passed away. But, uh, yeah, she was a special lady, took after eight kids. And, and uh, well, seven plus one, which is the equivalent of eight more, which was me. So, yeah, it was a real challenge. But she loved me and kept on loving me. And I wasn't very lovable at times. So, I just want to say Happy Mother's Day. And I especially want to say Happy Mother's Day to my daughter. And what a wonderful mother she is. I just watch her with her daughter, and I, here I am. Gram, 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 Grampy's getting emotional, but uh, it's so sweet to see her. And then Happy Mother's Day to Heather, who is a mother to so many, and half times a mother to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's uh, special. God is special, and God has planned motherhood. And much as the world tries to twist it all around and come up with crazy ideas, and uh, taking away even the term mother, saying no, I don't know what they're using now. They come up with new terms all the time. God made mothers, and we celebrate them today. I think I had a little song for the kids, so you guys, kids want to come up and do a song with me? Okay, here we go. So this little song is really easy, and because God is looking after us just like mothers look after us, he tells us to be careful what we see and what we do and what, where we go. So this little song is, Oh, Be Careful Little Eyes. Okay? So you do what I do. You ready? Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little hands what you do. Oh, be careful little hands what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what to do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. All right, thank you very much. God has given us so much. The other sacrifice that we'll be talking about this morning is the sacrifice of giving. The sacrifice of giving ourselves, of uh, reaching out to others, of giving ourselves a way that we might be a blessing to other people. God forgave my sins. In Jesus' name, I've been born again. Free. 
Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share His power as He told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received. So go in my name and because you believe, others will know that I live. Freely, freely you have received. So go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. So this morning is a continue in the book of Hebrews. Um, the last time we were together, we looked at the passage of Scripture um, concerning going outside the camp, the camp of, of the ceremony that was based on Old Testament regulations that were all done away with with the New Covenant because those ceremonies were all pictures of the coming of Christ. And now Christ has come. So you don't want to hold on to a shadow when you have the real thing. And that's all the Old Testament sacrifices were. They were shadows and pictures of what was to come. So what's the place of sacrifices or offerings for the Christian? Because I think there's confusion in, in Christendom in general about this idea. Many people think that they can make sacrifices to God where he looks at them and says, oh, that's really good, so I'm going to give you a reward or I'm going to take away some of your sins or, or sometimes people think they can actually pay money and that will somehow alleviate the sufferings of themselves or someone else in the afterlife when the Bible says it's destined to point out to man once to die after death comes to judgment that it's either this way or it's that way and you're not going to redeem somebody after they die redemption comes now and it comes personally as you put your faith in Jesus Christ so the place of sacrifice or offerings for the Christian is something that we need to kind of understand so I'm going to go back to the passage I looked at two weeks ago because I was, wasn't here last week and just read over it and a few comments and then we'll move on from there because the context is about this here. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. It is good the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We saw that it was vitally important to understand that it's grace that saves you. And grace is undeserved favor. It's not what you do for God, but it's what God has done for you. Because as soon as it becomes what you do for God, then lists start being made about what you need to do in order to be saved. And that list can grow awfully long. And religions begin to add more to the list as time goes on. And it becomes a huge construct and people get confused and they can't figure out the simplicity of the gospel is lost. And so suddenly people are going through these all kinds of rituals in hopes that somehow they might have eternal life if they do enough, if they practice enough religious practices, if they offer enough sacrifices of some kind, and then maybe God will accept them. But no assurance, lots of fear, and no reality when all the while Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever died for our sins, rose from the dead, and offers us salvation as a free gift. And when we move away from salvation in Jesus Christ alone, we move into a territory that is a strange doctrine according to the Word of God. We have an altar which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The Old Testament tabernacle is done with, it's gone. Now the new altar is Christ crucified for us. Not a physical altar that you go to and... and, and uh, and offer sacrifices on it and bulls and blood uh, 
blood of bulls and goats and, and lambs, etc. Because all of those were pictures of what was to come. And Jesus Christ has come. He has died for your sins. He has risen from the dead. And so it says in Hebrews 13, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought in the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. If you, this is all sounds new to you, then two weeks ago, you can go on YouTube, you can listen to the message. I'm not going to explain it again here, but what it says, let's go with Jesus. Let's go out where he is. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. He suffered outside the gate of religious practice. He, didn't, uh, uh, he wasn't uh, put to death in the temple on the altar at the tabernacle. He was put to death outside of the temple and outside of Jerusalem. Why? Because all of that is passed away and now Christ has come. Only in Jesus Christ is there the place to, go, to be. Christ and Him crucified is the answer for your life and for your sins. Don't go anywhere else. You can practice all the religion you want, but that's not impressing God. What, what, the only thing that God will accept is the sacrifice of his son, not what you do for sins. So let's go out to him outside the camp. Let's bear his reproach, it says. Let's bear what he received as a result of that. He was reproached. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was put aside. People mocked him, and they said, you know, well, who are you? What have you done? You know, uh, look at him. Uh, he saved others. He couldn't save himself, and they mocked him and did everything to challenge about who he was. So if you go outside the camp of just religious practices and ceremonies and rituals, and they may look at you and say, well, where's your altar? Ah, oh, my altar's in heaven. Uh, where's your sacrifices that God will accept? They've all, there's been one sacrifice for sins forever. So is there any room for Christians to have any kind of sacrifice? That's the question. So we're going to look at that now because it's uh, our, our, our place, the reality of our Christianity is not earth-based but heaven-based. It's not generated from earth up to heaven, but it's from heaven down to earth. And that's pretty good. I think it is anyway. Because what we produce from earth towards heaven has been a big stink. That's what we've done compared to what God has done in giving his son, Jesus Christ, for us. There's no comparison. Thank God that we are looking beyond what this world has to offer. If you've been setting your hopes in this world and all your dreams and your future, then, uh, you know, some days it looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? We have no idea what's around the corner and, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of the fishermen have been coming to the river. They say, we don't know what's going to happen next. It's scary. I had one fellow t tell me he was almost shaking, said, I I'm terrified. I'm terrified for my, my, grand my children and my grandchildren. What are they going to face the way things are going? And um, it's true. He's not off the mark at all. He's not that he's a, isn't necessarily a believer in the Bible at all, but he can see the handwriting on the wall. And if you have eyes at all, you'll see that too. And so, when we consider this, we come to Hebrews 13, 15. This is my text for today. Therefore, by him, that is Jesus, the one who went outside the camp, the one who sacrificed himself for our sins, the one who rose from the dead, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, and the one who wants to come into our lives and bring us transforming power, by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of, of, of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So twice we have the word sacrifice in both of these verses. A sacrifice of praise, sacrifice of doing good, and a sacrifice of sharing or giving. Those are three sacrifices that we find in these passages of Scripture. Which is interesting because the previous passages talk about the fact that the sacrifice for sins is done with. Now, that's why I want to give you a little list here. Uh, but first of all, look at 1 Peter 2, 2. It says, as newborn babes, see, that's where being born again comes in. You're a newborn babe. Desire the pure milk of the word so you might grow by it. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone. He was rejected indeed by men. But he's chosen by God and precious. That's Jesus. And you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. 
a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You're, he says we're to be offering up spiritual sacrifices. And that is every Christian. Now, I said this before and uh, when I was talking on our studies on the church on Wednesday, that every believer is a priest. The word priest was never used in the New Testament to represent a clergy person. The word priest is used in the context of saying that every believer is a priest. One high priest, Jesus Christ. Only one. No other person, no man on earth can take his place. Jesus Christ is the one high priest, and then every believer becomes part of the priesthood of God. Not to offer up blood sacrifices, not to offer up hocus pocus, this, that, and the other thing, but to offer up certain things that we're going to discover here that Christians are to offer up to God. I don't know if I'm making sense to you here, but that's what it says here. He speaks to all the believers and he says, you are living stones, built up a spiritual house. You're a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But the first thing I want to make clear is that the sacrifice for sins, which is the first one we will look at, you're not offering any of those. That's the one high priest job. That's Jesus. But you'll find in the Bible that we are called to place a sacrifice of self where we offer ourselves to God. You'll find where it says offer the sacrifice of praise. We just read that. And the sacrifice of doing good. We read that just now. And the sacrifice of giving. So we're going to look at all of these particular sacrifices the first one, the sacrifice for sins, is not something that we have done. It's something that God has done. Hebrews 10, 12 says, But this man, Jesus, after he offered how many sacrifices? One sacrifice for sins for how long? Forever. There's no more. There's only one sacrifice for sins forever. And then it says he sat down at the right hand of God. You know what that means when he says he sat down? It's done. It's done. There's no more sacrifice for sins. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, where is that offering at? Where was it? At the cross. Right. By one offering, he has done what? Perfected. Did you see that word? Perfected forever. Those who are being sanctified. This is such a powerful verse because it says we've already been perfected, but we're being sanctified means that we are in the process of being perfected. So what that says is that the sacrifice of Christ has given us a perfect standing in the sight of Almighty God now. But it also tells us that the practical outliving of that standing is something that God is continually doing so that we become more holy as we walk. So your position in the sight of God is perfect because the sacrifice was perfect, not because you are. Does that make sense? His sacrifice was perfect. If there was something lacking in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, if somehow he couldn't pay for quite all your sins, if he missed a couple of them, boom, you're done for. Because one sin is enough to damn you. But it's a perfect sacrifice, which means it's a perfect salvation, which means by one offering he has perfected. And it's a past tense word that's used here. Not that he will perfect them forever, but he has perfected them forever. That's the specific, specific, that's how specific it is. <laughs> he has perfected forever those who are being made holy. He is in the process of making you more holy as you walk, but he has already given you a perfect standing in his sight. Now, what confidence can that inspire in a person's life when they know that should they die at any moment, they will go into the presence of God? I remember one girl coming to me as I was preaching 
in a church somewhere else. I was doing evangelistic meetings, and she came to me. I, I, I've been miserable all my life. She said, I cry every night. And she said, I was brought up in a Christian home, but my Sunday school teacher told me, you might accept Christ as your Savior here, but if you go outside and sin and get run over by a bus, you'll go straight to hell. And I said, where in the world is that in the Bible? Well, I know there's no bus in, in the Bible, but there's a lot more of that that's not in the Bible. And I showed her that Jesus Christ's sacrifice was enough to save her completely. The Bible says he will save to the uttermost those who come to God by him. That his sacrifice was completely sufficient and it perfects you forever in the sight of God. Now I want you to understand, there are people who profess to be saved, but they are, they, there's no change in their life. If there's no change in your life, then you're not being sanctified. If you're not being sanctified, then you've never been perfected. Does that make sense? It all comes together. When a genuine person who trusts in Christ as their Savior and they become perfected forever by the grace of God, when that happens, then God begins to sanctify them and he gets the job done. You might fail, you might flip, you might flop at times, but he won't leave you alone. Oh, what a pest he can be. And thank God for that. He will chase you down and corner you because he loves you. Because he says, if you're going to trust in me, then I am going to look after you and I'll get you there. So praise the Lord, because without that, what utter despair and hopelessness do we have? Like that poor girl who went through all of that. But there as we prayed and I showed her the truth of scripture, oh, what a heart of rejoicing she had. And she went on to serve the Lord with joy, where before she was trying to find some way to make herself pleasing enough to God and terrified that any little sin she might commit would put her out of the kingdom of God. And now, since probably four or five years, she's gone home to glory to be with her Lord. But she didn't die in fear. She didn't die in despair. She died with glory on her lips and praise to her Savior. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I'll put it in their minds. I'll write, I will write them. In their minds, I will write them. You know, you could have a set of laws up here, and you could be saying, okay, I got to, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do. I got to try and do this, and that, that's going to, I'll do the best I can with that. And that was the Old Testament law, and it was given to show you what a sinner you are and how you couldn't keep the law. You think that you'll be saved by doing the best you can, but the purpose of the law is to show you up for what a sinner you are so that you will have Christ come and by the power of the Holy Spirit come, and he says, I will put them in your heart. I'll write them in your minds. And their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Isn't that great promises? Amen to that? Wow. This is a sacrifice for sins that Christ has made. This is not a sacrifice that you're going to make. You can't make this sacrifice. You can't make this happen. This is something that God does. And now it says in Hebrews 10, 18, now where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. I don't have to make an offering for sin. I don't have to go down to the church and say, okay, you know, I've sinned. I need an offering for sin. Oh, well, we'll make a sacrifice here. I don't have to do that. Why? Because there's been one sacrifice for sins for how long? Forever. It's done. There's no longer an offering for sin. It's finished. It's finished once for all. Hebrews 7, 27, who does not need daily concerning Christ as those high priests, Old Testament, to offer up sacrifices. First for his own sins and then for the people's. For this Jesus he did once for all when he offered up himself. Oh, to be able to look back and see the sacrifice of Christ, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place in heaven once for all. Is it not clear over and over again how he makes it clear? It's once for all, having obtained Temporary redemption for us? Is that what it says? No. Eternal redemption for us. It's done. Oh, friends, 
What joy comes to the soul when their eyes are open to see the simplicity of the sacrifice of Christ for their sins, that salvation is a done deal. When you trust him, he takes care of you. He looks after you. He obtained eternal redemption for you. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Again and again and again. The Bible makes this clear. So there's no confusion about it. You don't have to live in trepidation and fear if you're truly converted. But the evidence of true conversion will be transformation. Conversion always produces transformation. So that is the first sacrifice I wanted to talk about. The ultimate sacrifice made by Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins. That's a done deal. So don't go in any direction where you think somehow the sacrifice that will make here will somehow help me get into God's heaven. Only one sacrifice. And that's such a relief, I can tell you. But we're still called priests and we're still to offer spiritual, holy sacrifices to God. So what do we have to offer? Christ gave himself for us. He died for our sins. He's paid the price so we can go to heaven. What do we got to offer? We're supposed to offer ourselves. That's what he says. Look what it says in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you or beg of you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Now, I want you to notice it says a living sacrifice. So he's not talking about you going and getting killed on some altar somewhere. He's talking about you offering your whole being to the Lord. You're saying to the Lord, Lord, you can have me. You can have all of me. Lord, I'm not holding anything back. I'm presenting myself to you. And you know what it says? It's your reasonable service. Or the, the NIV says it's your spiritual worship. It's giving yourself completely over to God, saying, Lord, I present myself to you. And my friends, there is a sense here in the tense to be continually saying to the Lord, Lord, you have all of me. Because yesterday, maybe I surrendered. But today, has there been a day when you haven't surrendered? Have there been days as a believer where you haven't let the Lord have his way in your life? Anybody here agree with that? I do. Many days I don't. But this is Paul writing to them. And he says, I'm begging you. That's the word that's used here. It's a, it's a strong word because this is the only way to live. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. But this is by presenting your whole being to God. Say, Lord, you have all of me. Take me, Lord. Take me to the cross. It's not my life. It's your life. Lord, it's not my time. It's your time. It's not this. It all belongs to you. And I can tell you there's a great joy there. There's a great life to be lived there. And many Christians are only living on the edge of this when God calls you daily to say, Lord, take all of me. That is uh, your, shall we say, priestly duty as a believer in Jesus Christ is to be offering your whole being as a living sacrifice to God. Lord, it's not my life. Lord, it's not my lips. It's not my thoughts. It's your thoughts. I'm giving myself completely over to you. I'm trusting you with this. And because he is the divine creator, as I said earlier, okay, well, <laughs> who, who am I going to trust enough to say he can have my thoughts? You're not going to trust anybody with that. Maybe your spouse. But when it's God himself, the creator who made you, when he knows every way that your brain works and he knows every thought that you could ever have, when he says, I can make things right, there is something wrong with humanity. If, there was, if humanity was right, we wouldn't have the mess that we're in, but there's something wrong with humanity. And if we're prepared to be humble enough to say, yeah, there's something wrong with me, I need God to fix me because I've been broken. And if I'm willing to come to him and say, Lord, I surrender here, I'm broken. It's like if a child brings me a toy and says, it's broken, can you fix it, Grampy? So I take it and I put it back together. Oh, it's like new again, well, hopefully. And so we've been broken and we come to our God and we say, God, can you fix me? God, can you fix what's broken in me? He says, yes, I can fix it. Just give me it. Just give me it. I'll fix you. 
I'll fix what's broken because I'm God. And I know what makes you tick. So as much as you are willing to surrender your life to God, then you will experience the fixing power of God, shall we say. Come to Jesus. Come now, come today, surrender now, and you will discover he is willing to do more for you, in you, and through you than you could ever imagine. And that's why Galatians 2.20, which is a verse I keep coming back to, is so important. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I who lives. It's not the old person now. There's a new creation. I'm a new person. Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in this body, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God. And so just as you are saved by grace, just as you are saved by God giving you the gift of himself at the cross for your sins, you are also sanctified or made holy by grace. So it's not like something that you do so much as you're willing to let him do what he can do in your life. And so by grace you're saved and by grace you live. It's all the power of God, not yours. Sometimes I've gone to people and I've said, you know, you know that you need Jesus. Yeah, I do. But I can't live that life. I can't do it. I tried and I couldn't do it. And I said, well, there's the problem. Of course you can't live the Christian life. Nobody can live the Christian life without Jesus. Which means if I'm going to live a holy life, I need a holy God to accomplish it. The imitations don't work. They don't work and the people see through them and you see through them too. You know the failure you are without Jesus. So let me encourage you to present your whole being as a living sacrifice. That's what God calls you to do. And let him do the transforming, transforming the changing. The sanctifying is done by him. We have already saw that in the previous verse. So what other sacrifices do I bring to the Lord? And this takes us to our passage the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and forgive me. It looks like I missed a K in there. Um, yeah, me and typing, they don't go well together. The sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Now, you're not going to be praising and thanking God if you don't even believe in him. And you're not going to be praising and thanking him if there's no experience of him in your life. So here's what it says in Hebrews 13, 15, the passage that we were in. Therefore, by Jesus, by him, now, I want you to notice that because Christ suffered for our sins, because he went outside the camp, because we have no continuing city here, because he is the salvation, he is our savior, because he is the supreme sacrifice for our sins, by him, let us continually. If I am not willing to surrender my life to him, I won't be giving him praise. By him. I just love that. I love that because it takes the burden off me. It leaves me in a place where I say, okay, God, you are everything for me. It's all your strength. It's all your presence that changes me. By him, by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to offer the sacrifice of praise. We were made to praise God. And it says continually, ongoing. Yes, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Things go wrong. We're peculiar people. We rejoice when things go wrong. We shed tears and we are happy. We sing a brand new song. How can you rejoice when things go wrong? Because I can rejoice in the Lord. I can continually offer a sacrifice of praise. Even in hard places, I can praise God. And I've proven that, and many of God's people have as well. We can still praise the Lord. We don't understand sometimes what's happening. Our hearts are breaking at times. We're going through difficult circumstances, but we can still praise the Lord. We have someone to praise and someone to give thanks to because there is much that we could give thanks to God for even in the darkest hours, in the darkest places. Because we know we have no continuing city here. Because we know where our destination is. Because we know who has our hand. There's another hymn says, I don't know who holds tomorrow. 
I mean, I don't know about tomorrow, <laughs> but I know who holds my hand. And I want you to notice something here. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, and then he says something here interesting, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, why does it say the fruit of our lips? Anybody? Why does it say that? What's that? Uh, okay, watch what you say. Apparently. Huh? Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, but why does it say the fruit of our lips? Okay, so what are lips for besides kissing? They're to say something, right? So here he says, continually praise God with the fruit of our lips. So that means not just, oh, you know, I can praise God in my mind, and that's enough. No. He says, use your mouth to praise God. God knows you use your mouth for a lot of other things, don't you? And some of those things aren't very good. Why not take the lips that God has given you, the ability to speak if you can, if somebody can't speak, of course, that's not the issue. But if, if God has given you lips to speak, then use those lips to praise God. You'll use them for everything else. Tonight, as I'm cheering on the Toronto Maple Leafs, I will use my lips. <laughs> go Leafs, go. All you Montreal fans. <laughs> the fruit of our lips. If I'm willing to praise or to, to shout and holler for a team or anything else, why wouldn't I shout and praise for Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't I use my lips to honor God? So let me encourage you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him in the evening. Praise Him when the sun goes down. If He is all that He says He is, He's far better than the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Montreal Canadiens or any other person that has ever walked on the face of the earth. There's no comparison to anyone. Who do you compare with Jesus Christ? You can't find anyone. So use your lips for what they were meant to be used. To praise Jesus. So praise the Lord. Praise Him. I'll praise Him in the congregation, but I'll praise Him on the streets. I'll praise Him down at the fish trap when people come to visit. I will tell them this is what God has made. When I tell them the stories of how the fish are and how amazing it is that they can find their way to exactly the river they were meant to go to. When in 1950, uh, when did the causeway go in? Somebody help me. 50, 51? Okay, I'll take your word for it, Gord. It's on tape, you know. Okay. In 1951, when the causeway was put in, all the Gasparo usually came through the causeway and then came up to the Marguerite River on that side. However, they put the causeway in. They blocked off all the migration of the fish. The, 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 the strait was filled with fish with nowhere to go. But they turned around and they made their way. It took them a month and they made their way completely around Cape North all the way through Dingwall, all the way down to the Marguerite River, and they came up the river that they were meant to go up. They knew that they had to go to the river they were spawning. They can smell the water, and they can smell it to such small particles. It's amazing. God did this. This is amazing, the way God has designed things to be. And the amazing thing is, the next year, my grandfather told me the story, the next year they were on time. They knew how to get there from there on. And so the Lord has created everything. So I can give praise to God for that and say, Lord, look what you've done. How do you do this, Lord? It's amazing what God does. We have so much to praise God for, even in when we see his handiwork and everything. I have, uh, how many sunsets have you seen and looked and said, wow. Isn't it wonderful to have somebody to give thanks to for it and say, thank you, Jesus, for the beautiful sunset? 
I remember reading an article in a magazine, his Nature magazine, and this guy was a hiker and he was up in northern Ontario and, and, it, and he, he said, I'm an atheist, but I stood on, the, on this big cliff and I looked over at all the grand panorama that I saw and he said, I wish there was somebody I could give thanks to for it. Imagine. He, he longed to be able to give thanks to somebody for it. He just didn't know who Jesus was. When I read that, tears welled up in my eyes as I thought that the darkness that is on our world, that the evidence of God is all around us in creation and it's amazing how everything fits together like a glove and people think that it could have evolved into this and into that. And they, it's, it's unbelievably, it's a big lie. And it's the deliberate attempt to turn us away from the reality of the living God so that we are using our lips what they were meant to do to give thanks to his name. Jeremiah 33, 11 says, The voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. And those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. The context of this was the restoration. The Jews had been exiled away from into Babylon, but... The promise was given by Jeremiah that they would come back rejoicing. For once they were captive, and now they're being set free. And that's exactly the way it is for us. Once we were captive to sin, once we were captive to darkness, once we were captive to blindness, but now we can see. And so we bring the sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Isaiah 43, 21 says, The people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. Psalm 156, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Psalm 147, 1, praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Wonderful. So, uh, 2 Samuel twenty two fifty. Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. First Chronicles sixteen eight. O give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. First Chronicles sixteen thirty four. O give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Praise, praise, praise. Ah, isn't it great? Let me try something. I'm going to say praise the Lord and I want to hear a shout praise the Lord. Do you think you could do that? That's the fruit of your lips. Could you actually do that today? Everyone shout praise the Lord. Okay? So I'm going to say praise the Lord and I want to hear praise the Lord in a shout. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Release your lips. Release them to praise God. Don't hold back on that. Start praising him because that's what you're called to do and you will find a deeper joy come. Not in empty words, that's not what I mean, but as you walk in a surrendered place to him, you discover it. I'm running out of time. Sacrifice of doing good. Hebrews 13, 16, but to do not forget to do good and to share with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God calls you to do good. I am not interested in people who profess to be born again or saved and they live the same life. There's no goodness coming out of them. They're, some of them are as hateful as can be. They may even be preaching from the Bible, but they're full of hardness and harshness and there's no love of God in their lives. No, we're called to do good because God is well pleased with that offering that we go about doing good. Listen, Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And what did Jesus do? He went about doing good. That's what he did. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Jesus went about doing good and your call is to go about doing good. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against such things as this. But I want you to know when it says goodness, it means lived out goodness. It doesn't mean a theoretical goodness. It means that goodness is your lifestyle. Is it yours? Goodness. Oh, praise the Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus, that we are, to, are living a life of goodness in a world of badness is a, an opportunity that we have to honor God and to praise Him. He's pleased with this. Why? Not because He's just looking at you and saying, oh, here's a brownie cookie for being good. Of course not. It's because goodness affects other people. Goodness brings blessing to others. That's why. He wants blessing to flow. And the last one is a sacrifice of sharing and giving. And this is also mentioned here. It says, yeah, back to Hebrews 13, 16. Don't forget to do good and to share with such sacrifices. God is well pleased. And that word share means to give, to give of yourself, to give. And that might be giving time. That might be giving money. That might be uh, giving your... Uh, compassion towards other people and uh, in Philippians 2 3 it says don't let anything be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves looking for ways to give to others in 2 Corinthians 8 1 it speaks about financial giving and says brothers and sisters we want you to know about the grace of God has given to the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. This, uh, the, the church in Jerusalem was experiencing famine and they were in dire straits. And so they actually went about and they took offerings to help the people who were starving. And it said, he, Paul writes and he says, the Macedonian churches, they were, had extreme poverty, but they gave in rich generosity. And I think you've heard me say this before. It is often the poorest people that give the most. It really is. They say that the is it Christmas Daddies programs or whatever, that uh, actually Cape Bretoners by proportion outgive most places in Canada. And we're one of the poorest places in Canada. For I testify, they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And so God is pleased when we are willing to give because we've already given our own selves to the Lord. He owns everything anyway. And whatever he tells us to give, we give. They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, and here's what the word is, first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So if you haven't given yourself to the Lord, don't bother giving anything at all. You know, we, we don't have uh, big uh, campaigns here and saying, you know, give money to the church. We want money. We want money. I, I don't want your money. I want you to know Jesus. And if you know Jesus and you have a generous heart, then the Lord will put on your heart what to give and what's needed and you'll meet needs and you'll look for people who have needs and you'll try to meet those by the generosity that God has showed to you you too will find yourself being generous because God calls us to be generous to others to look after others and uh, so the rest of it says we urge Titus that he has begun so he would also complete this grace in you as well but as you abound in everything, in faith and in speech and in knowledge and diligence and your love for us, abound in this grace also, that is in giving. And uh, we know that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was the one who gave the most when he gave himself. In Acts 2.44, it says, All who believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. And Acts 20, 35 says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this, you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, finally, uh, in 1 Timothy 5, 17, it's about actually giving to the church. And you know, sometimes I, 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 I don't talk much about giving to the church, so to speak. But here's what it says in terms of the leadership and those who are doing the preaching and teaching. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now I'll read this in a little easier translation for you. Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. But the scripture says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. In another place, those who work 
deserve their pay. So God's called us to accept the sacrifice for sins that Jesus Christ has done. And then by the mercy, by the grace of God, we present ourselves as a sacrifice to the Lord. Lord, take all of us. We are filled with the sacrifice of praise. We are, uh, had the sacrifice of doing good and then the sacrifice of giving. And there's no, you lose nothing in going in this direction. It's a wonderful life to be a Christian. It's a wonderful life to live this way in the midst of this world where everything seems to be, I got to grab everything I can for myself and make my own way. If you don't do it, it's not going to get done. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Forget everybody else. Look after yourself. And all the while, the Lord offers us a whole new way to live. Don't miss it. Don't miss it in salvation and don't miss it in Christian living. You will not be disappointed to walk in the ways of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today and thank you for the truth of it. And we pray, Father, that, Lord, you will grip our hearts afresh, that we will be continually praising you, we'll be continually honoring you and thanking you, Lord, for the sacrifice that you've made, the full, complete, wonderful sacrifice, that, Lord, we will be those who go about doing good, that we'll be known as the people who do good. And, Lord, where we see a need, that we'll be ready to give. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stay for lunch.